out. Yeah, we want to build a cob house. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching Common Sense Cooking. I'm James, hope you're having a wonderful day. So unfortunately, as you can see in the background, my awesome backyard view has been taken away from me. I don't know what kind of work they're doing back there, but I'm no longer gonna have that great pasture scene. I'll make some adjustments based on that, depending on what goes on back there as to future videos and such. But I've been away for two weeks now, I guess. And within that two weeks, I went to the Mother Earth News Fair. Uh, you might ask, what is the Mother Earth News Fair? And that's just kind of the, I guess the, the way I've been putting it is it's a homesteading fair. You know, it covers gardening, farming, raising animals like chickens, pigs, cows, uh, how to build your own house in various ways, all that kind of stuff. It was a great experience. And so I, I thought I would just talk about that a little bit. What did I learn while I was there? Well, uh, some of the things that I went to, I, w I went to some cob workshops if you don't know what cob is it's a um, it's an English term and basically it's uh, a way of building buildings that has been going on for centuries a mixture of sand uh, clay and straw and when you mix those things together in a certain ratio it's about 75% let's see I think 50 to 75% sand uh, some clay, uh, the rest of that being clay, and then straw is almost like a, a separate element. And then of course you need water to mix all that together. And basically that can uh, create a building material. And you'll see that in old English buildings, you'll see it in Middle Eastern buildings. Uh, you know, it, it's a very, in the, the course of history, it's a very common way of building uh, houses and other things. And it turns your, um, whatever you're building into a monolithic structure. So what does that mean? Uh, if you're building a, a brick building, well, you have individual bricks. That's not monolithic because the, it, you're taking separate pieces and combining those together. Well, if you, if you mix this uh, material together and you put it all together, well, then that becomes one one giant brick basically and that's what a monolithic structure means uh, that's one of the things that we're interested in doing uh, maybe in a couple of years we'll buy some land and we'll build our own house i'm planning on doing maybe a, a timber frame structure and then uh you know, you know the walls would be there might be hay bales for uh, insulation and then cob on the outside to make the walls and everything so uh, that was very helpful um, let's see some of the things that I learned as far as cob structures go um, one of my biggest questions was uh, you know in our area in Texas it gets really hot during the day but it also stays hot at night a lot of times when cob is used, it's um, it's in areas that are you know really hot during the day, and then maybe it cools down at night. And so what happens uh, is the heat will hit the cob, the cob absorbs the heat, and then overnight it will slowly release that heat throughout the night. Well, in our area, it gets hot during the day and it stays hot at night, so that's not very helpful. So what, what I was able to talk to the guy about is, you know, what kind of insulation I needed. So it's kind of been confirmed that if we're going to stay in this area, which, you know, our godparents are here, our church family is here, I feel like, you know, we're in no place to leave the security of, of the church family that we've, you know, entered the church uh, with. <laughs> My son is being hilarious <laughs> and really cute. Yeah, we want to build a cob house. So we're going to need to have some sort of insulation, but we want to keep it as natural as possible. So what we've been told is that we can use uh, straw bales. If you've heard of straw bale houses, uh, that's an option here. So basically what will happen is instead of with uh, regular cob, the sun will you know heat up the cob and then it'll radiate throughout the night. What will happen is the sun will radiate, will hit the cob, and then it'll have this insulation of this uh, straw bale, and then the straw will become a, uh, a barrier for that heat, and then it won't hit the inner internal uh, cob, you know, that's on the other side. So that's one thing, a major thing I, I learned about. I also uh, went to a class about <laughs> using um, 
uh, mushroom mycelium. So uh, fungus will create this uh, structure that looks very similar to the human nervous system. And that, that structure will, will hold together a lot of things. So if you put, um, this guy talked about, if you put mycelium, um, which is a fungus from mushrooms, if you put mycelium in bricks, and then you were to wet the bricks and then put them together, then that mycelium would uh, kind of grow through the bricks and connect to all the other bricks and create a natural mortar. But you can also uh, put uh, mycelium, you can you know, basically take the straw that you're gonna use for your cob house and you're going to uh, put mycelium, uh, mushroom mycelium in that that straw and it's going to hold it all together a lot better so that was very interesting also in that talk uh he talked a lot about a lot of other things that mushrooms can do uh what i'll do is i'll uh in the description i'll put the his book because very it was very interesting uh his uh, foundation has come up with certain um uh fungi fungi uh mushrooms that will kill fire ants uh, which is very interesting. You can just sprinkle this uh, mycelium onto a fire ant pile. And then he said within 48 hours, it'll kill all the uh, fire ants within a certain radius. And it won't just kill any ants if you're trying to keep certain um, ants alive, which is understandable because what you want in a permaculture or within a uh, natural holistic you know farm situation is a lot of biodiversity well fire ants are kind of an exception because they're they're kind of an extreme when it comes to the uh, consequences versus the benefits so so this will tar actually target certain ants but let the other ones live uh, which I think is very helpful. You know, we live in a um, in our Western modern society. We live in a situation where we want to control every aspect of our lives. Well, that that has caused problems because there there are uh, symbiotic relationships in nature that we've cut out and we've you know tried to control, and it's made uh, major issues for the environment, for um, just our overall health, and so. Uh, it's nice to um, to think that you you could control a certain aspect. There's a lot of information there. Uh, you can read the book. I'll probably go into it more in other videos. I uh, just want to kind of move on and kind of go over some of the other stuff that I learned. So uh, another seminar that I went to was about uh, integrating animals into your farm and into the workings of your growing uh, plants, whether it's trees, you know, fruit trees, nut trees, or your annual plants. And that was very helpful because the thing is, there's so much to go into uh, that I, I won't have time for. But basically, anything that a machine can do, an animal can do. So if you're just trying to kind of open up the soil in a certain area and have all the bramble and the, you know, the area in between the trees cleared out, you don't have to get, go get a bush hog, just get some pigs. And the thing is, the pigs will go in there, they'll eat everything that's there, and then by the time they're done with it, then you can kill them and eat bacon. And of course, there's there are also seminars on how you kill an animal so that it has a wonderful life up until the end. You know, that all, all that is obvious, you know, I guess except for in our culture, which we only think of industrial farming, which is, you know, very cruel to animals, you know, entirely unnecessary. But in a holistic situation, you're looking at what does the farm need? What, what do we need to manage the, the land properly? And there, for sure, there's an animal that's going to help with that. So uh, just, just real quick, if I can do this very quickly, I'm just going to talk about if you were to go into a desert, you know, where there's just sand. So what does that desert need in order to, to thrive, in order to be, you know, you, you think about, you know, the promised land. It says that there was a land filled with milk and honey, and now you go into that area and it's just sand. So what, what happened? Well, you know, it would take a long time to go into what happened, but if we wanted to talk about, you know, how to, to return it to its former glory, well, uh, what you need is roots. What you need is plants because when it rains, and of course in those areas of uh, where there's desertification, whenever it rains, that rain is just, you know, kind of sliding off, uh, off the sand. And that's due to bad human management practices. But if you were to get some roots in that area, if you were to get some plants there, so that when it rains, there would be something there to absorb the moisture and hold it in that soil, then that would keep that area from being sand. It would start to create soil. So how do you do that? Well, you know, 
I've kind of, as a purist, I tend to be a purist, so I think of, well, you know, humans are messing everything up, and so what we need to do is just, you know, go back to nature, let nature do its thing, not meddle in that whole process. Well, that's a problem because, I mean, you know, according to my uh, foundational beliefs, which actually for some reason is not how I figured out this is a problem, but according to my foundational beliefs, humans were always meant to be part of the natural system. So as it turns out, uh, since we have created these national parks where humans are not allowed to meddle, uh, those areas, all the trees are dying, all the natural areas are dying, because what is required in order to keep a healthy system is human management. And uh, that also includes animals, livestock. And you know, what it needs is, you know, if an area is already deserted, there's no topsoil at all, what you would do is you would take animal manure and you would mix it with carbon, like um, wood chips, as an example. You'd mix those together and they work together to create uh, compost. So you can put that on top of sand and then you can plant plants in there. Well, once you have plants, they, they create roots and they'll go down into the sand. And then once the once it rains, uh, those roots and that soil that you've created will hold on to the water. That water will stay there. That will create more biodiversity. Those plants, all except for what you eat, will die and they will turn into more soil and it, the process will continue. The problem with uh, sand currently is that it doesn't have any roots there. Well, here's the thing. All right, once you get to the point to where you have a root system and you have grass and everything and they're continually growing well if they keep on growing up and there's nothing nothing there to eat them down herbivores like cows or sheep or anything like that there's nothing there camels uh, nothing there to eat that grass down well what happens is that grass grows it grows it grows it becomes old and then it dies well then that grass you know isn't rejuvenating every cycle in order to continue on so what you need is good human management bring in the sheep uh, on a rotation bring in the cows on a rotation let them eat it down when it's time and then let it and then give it rest let it grow in its time and and when you have that process i mean it's been proven you can you can go to youtube you can you know go to google whatever it is and you can uh, do these searches and you can find that with good human management and good livestock you can uh, start to create grass in these desert areas anyway <laughs> once again I'm kind of you know belaboring the point these are things that I'll probably talk about in future episodes so I'll move on all right so here is the crux of it all the very reason that I went to this fair in the first place is because Justin Rhodes was going to be there. If you don't know who Justin Rhodes is, he is what you might call a superstar of the uh, holistic agriculture, uh, permaculture, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, part of that movement that wants to create a farming system that includes animals, plants, biodiversity, all of these things that are natural, uh, that we have kind of cut out of the, the process. He's kind of a superstar of that, and I can honestly say him and Joel Salatin, you know, uh, Justin Rhodes' family, Rebecca, don't want to leave her out, but them, them as a family and Joel Salatin have been by far the, the biggest influences on myself and my wife's life in our excitement for getting involved in this process. And so being able to go to this fair where he was going to be, and then ultimately I got to meet him was a huge inspiration in and is uh, uh, for sure going to help me help us to move forward with this uh, make sacrifices that are necessary to make you know we're at the very beginning of this process and so being able to meet him and talk to them um, was a, was just a really big uh, help and inspiration so that was awesome I'll put up a picture of him and I um, you know him is uh, Rebecca and I all of us um, you know taking a picture together it was a great moment but that kind of transformed transitions me into another segment which is I'm very unsatisfied with this picture uh, I've always struggled with my weight and uh, this picture was one of those aha moments that really showed me you know how far I've come uh, I think you know as I've gotten closer to 30 I, I've just noticed that I, you know where it was already difficult to keep weight off and to lose weight uh, it's become even significantly more difficult, so I'm going to have to take some extra efforts. And I feel like um, Justin Rhodes has actually been a pretty big inspiration in that, where not only do I need to be doing the farm life, doing the physical activity, 
Uh, I have a very sedentary job at the moment. And on top of that, it causes a lot of stress uh, that, I'm, that I've never been used to before. I have a family and that causes uh, stress that I'm not used to having before. And it's just, I've found it very, uh, even even more difficult to lose weight than I, than I had before. So, here's my challenge. Uh, you can see the picture of me with Justin Rhodes and Rebecca Rhodes. And uh, my, my mission is to meet them next year, be able to take a picture with them next year, and to be happy with what I see there, that I'm a healthy person, that I put into practice those things that he's inspired me to do, uh, and, and and Rebecca for sure. She She's talked a lot about recipes and her health journey that has helped me and my wife out a lot. And you know, you know, both of them have been a huge inspiration. So as the audience of this channel, uh, what you might start to see is my workout program. Uh, I'm very partial to calisthenics, what you might call a convict conditioning program, uh, something of that sort. And so what I may do is start putting up updates on you know my progress in this area. Obviously Lent is coming up and so that's going to be a huge help in me being able to kind of discipline my body. I feel like I've become uh, too comfortable and you know missing meals and all that. So what I might be doing is uh, during Lent, you know Monday, Wednesday and Friday, maybe I'll do a day of uh, you know water fasting, not eating any food and then I'll eat on Sunday, you know Saturday, uh, Tuesday and Thursday. And you know, I, I don't know what's gonna happen, but basically I wanna take my health very seriously. And I, you know, I, I think I'm starting to understand I'm gonna have to take a special effort, um, even more so than I had to before now, uh, in order to be be healthy person. So you'll see some updates and, and everything about what I'm doing to get to that goal. But you know, if Justin Rhodes or Rebecca Rhodes, if either of you guys see this, uh, just know that you are inspiring me that by next year, I want to take a picture with you and I want to be be able to show that I'm healthier. Obviously, that's not my ultimate conviction. You know, as an Orthodox Christian, uh, I just feel it in my bones. I'm like, I'm I'm a very poor example of Orthodoxy because I'm showing gluttony in in you know my my physical form, and so. You know, that's obviously a, a huge conviction, a huge mover for me to be able to uh, get into shape because, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's embarrassing and I do feel like orthodoxy is setting up a healthy perspective for me of what, how I should view food and such. So anyway, you know, you'll see more updates on that. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, hopefully I'll be putting out a video very soon, maybe about um, garden updates and what we're planning on doing with our current land that we're renting. You know, I look forward to uh, future videos. Thank you so much. Uh, please click like and subscribe if you if you like this video. Please share this if you know of anyone else who's interested in this. You know, the, the goal of this project is to be an orthodox influence of daily life. And so if you, if you want to follow this and you know other people who would be interested in following this, please go ahead and share that. Uh, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. God bless.